We are in Champions League, man. That was my dilly next question. Dilly dong, come on. Into Sheringham and so sure and funny. I will love it if we beat them. Love it. This is the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast with Gary Kearney. Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. This is number 11 of the Culture Series that we've been doing alongside World Strides Excel. World Strides Excel, the industry leader in international soccer tours with over 15 years experience delivering soccer tours for a wide range of clientele, including teams and coaches. Easily done, you pick the country or countries and their experts will customize a trip That includes competitive matches, training sessions, tickets to pro games, sightseeing and much more. They also work above and beyond to offer a level of quality support and service, including financial assistance, liability coverage, flights and hassle-free travel. So not only are we partnering with World Strides Excel to bring you the Culture Podcasts, but we're also working with them to organise the first ever Modern Soccer Coach Education tour to Barcelona on February 6th to February 12th 2019. Really excited about going to Spain. The trip will feature coaching clinics, academy visits, workshops, stadium tour and of course a trip to the new camp itself. We're opening registration tonight so the details will be on my social media. If you wanted to send me a message, email gary at modernsoccercoach.com to find out a little more. Really, really excited about going to Barcelona with a group of coaches who are as excited about finding as much about a different culture as I am. So on this podcast, we are joined by Stephanie McCaffrey. Steph is a professional player currently with the Chicago Red Stars. She's played six times for the US full national team. She's also played a number of times at the under-23 level. She was a superstar at Boston College and at the youth levels. So I've been fortunate to work with her this season with the Red Stars. She's one of my favorite people to talk to. As you're going to hear, she has an insane level of awareness about the game, her game team dynamics and just the soccer culture in this country in general. She also is looks in a, at the game and life in a really, really refreshing way. So this is the first one we've done about the US women's soccer culture. And we're touching on a number of things here. We're going to talk about the development process, what, what Steph grew up with in terms of country clubs, how that impacted her motivation, what she learned in college what advice she has for coaches on building the culture piece and then talking about what it was like inside the US culture, the women's national team culture, what made it special. We'll also talk about social media, how that impacts players, how that impacts teams and then we'll finish up, we'll talk about Steph's current work with her her non-profit, her charity work with Hidden Gems which is a phenomenal project. So really really excited uh, to have this chat. We did the whole season and we done this on the last weekend whenever we were up in Portland for the semi-final. So really excited to bring it out. Uh, I would advise all youth coaches to listen to it, college coaches to listen to it, but I would advise you as well to send this to your parents. Uh, for club coaches, for high school coaches, because this is just an insight into what the players feel when they're going through the journey, what the players feel they need from coaches, from each other, from themselves and from their parents as well. So Steph is, is outstanding here. There's an awful lot to get through. Uh, please let me know what you think. Always, always, always love hearing your thoughts. At Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. If you want to shoot me an email as well, feel free, Gary at modernsoccercoach.com. Let me know what you think. Here's Steph. Enjoy. Steph, thanks so much for joining me for the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Happy to be here. Finally, excited to get you on the show yeah. at long last. I'm a hard woman to find. You're locked down. Hard to lock down, yeah, for sure. I'm gonna start off with uh, on the development side. Your journey as a player is the quintessential dream pathway for a youth soccer player. 
superstar youth level, college player, pro player, national team player? Was it as easy as this sounds in your formative years? Um, I think it was easy until I got to college. And I think that when, when you've had a pretty, um, I would say like favorable and like, I didn't like, I didn't face, must have face much adversity going through like high school. Um, and then all of a sudden you get to college and you hit kind of what I would call your first roadblock where you're like my freshman year, we had three forwards that were youth national team players. So I didn't start, I was playing like 45 minutes a game, but I wasn't coming off the bench. And I just remember the, I, or I just remember the feeling of like showing up to the field and like not being in the starting 11 for the first time and like having to process that and like you think that that's the greatest adversity you'll ever face like as a person but then like you up the ante and you get to the pro level and like you're it's your first year of professional soccer and you're being yelled at by players that are 30 you know this is their life this is their job and um, then after that, like, uh, when I was with the national team, like, getting released from the national team and having to, like, transfer, transition in back to professional players, like, I would say there's, like, tiers of adversity that you face throughout your career, and every, as the, as the level of play increases, like, so does the level of difficulty that you have to face. So would it be right in saying that your first level of adversity wasn't till you were in college? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, like, I don't... In, I think it's, you know, not technically the right answer to say, like, I had a pretty easy ride through high school, like, but I think it's worse to kind of make up problems that weren't there. And I think for a lot of us, like, sitting on the Red Stars and in this room, um, in high school, like, we, it was pretty, you were just a lot better than everyone, to put it bluntly. And then, so, like, then when there's just, like, a shocking increase in tier and level of play, you're faced with, like, shocking increases, like, in adversity. And, like, for the first time, you have to dig your heels in and fight. But I think that it's good because, I mean, if you... Going through life on kind of, like, a free ride doesn't prepare you for anything you're going to face in the long run. So I think coming out of high school, I was shocked because it would it had always been, like, next award, next, like, congratulations, next thing. And then all of a sudden you get to college and you're like, wow, everyone had that same prom queen free ride. (laughs) For some reason, as a coaching community, everyone's quick to take credit for developing players. Player, I coach player X or I coach player Y. But how much of your development do you think was down to being coached? And how much of it do you think was down to either athleticism or natural talent? Um, I don't know. I think... I've I've been asked this question before, and like I kind of break it up into thirds. I think a third of it was natural talent. Um, I think a third of it was being coached, and I think a third of it was like kind of technical work I put in on my own. But what's interesting is, um, I think it's fair to say that people like what they're good at, and I think that if I wasn't like blessed with a natural um, athletic ability and talent. Um, I wouldn't have been coached by the best coaches, you know, because I wouldn't have been athletic enough to put myself in the situation of those club teams. And then if I wasn't in the situation of the club team, like, I never would have. It Like, you don't see random people who play on JV soccer going out really and practicing on their own because they know it's not going to take them there. So it's interesting how, like, yes, it was definitely due to coaching, and yes, it was due to time put on my own, but if you look back at it, like, it's just human nature for us to focus on things we think we have, we have a future in. So that was, like, it's funny to think about that. If I wasn't born, like, being faster than the average person, like, maybe none of this would happen. Could it, going back to then your first thing, could a coach have all that technical work and coaching that you got on the pitch, could a coach have prepared you or helped prepare you for an, an adversity to get to receive it before you were 18 years of age at the college level? Could a club coach have exposed you to anything a little bit more psychologically? I think, honestly, I think no. I think that um, the cool part about uh, the cool part about adversity is like it's organic and you don't see it coming, and um, there like you can't you can't really create like a prototype. There's no prototype. There's no way to do it. Like that's, and also it if it doesn't feel authentic, it doesn't scare you as much. I mean, yeah, like they can sit you on the bench in club, but 
you're realistic about what's at players at this level are realistic you know if the person in front of you is a threat or not and I think that um you know club coaches can try but like players know in their heart what's really going on and for me it was just the first time I really felt like I had pressure on me was when you see people at practice and you're like this girl's gonna push me which was interesting was there a support when that decision was made to not start you at Boston College was there a support in place for the coaches or was that very much you deal with it yourself and it's a little bit of independence and responsibility yeah no of course like they're um like I think it was the coaches at BC did, did a good job of it so like they um our coach Allison Foley was great at managing players um I still played a lot so I was like very much a part of the plans in the team but um so she kind of she set a good standard where, like, she definitely cared about all 20 players on our roster, but at the same time set the standard that whether you're in the 11 or you're not, or you're a player 11 to 20, like, you have to be bought into the team goal. Um, and I think that they were willing to manage – they were willing to manage us and give us extra time and whatever you want as long as you did your part in return, which was support the players that were on the field so the team could win. If the college dynamics was different and you were on the – you were seeing games that you didn't get on the pitch – would have been harder for you, I would imagine. Yeah, I think like that, you know, like I expected, um, I think, it, yeah, like just because it was hard enough. Like as, adversity is kind of like a ladder where like it comes in rungs. And I think that like a little bit of adversity is great um, and it's easier to process. But I think as an 18 year old kid, if I went from kind of walking on water in the soccer world where I came from to being nobody, um, I think every like kid has a psychological limit and I don't I don't know I think I would have liked to say that I would have come back from that but um I think it, it's human nature it's always feel hard to feel as much as part of a team when you're not seeing the field at all or you just you want people want to feel like they're contributing mm -hmm. so that was good for me to definitely get some time and experience and it was probably the biggest thing was it was a great improving tool um to get game time because then you had to deal with that by going to work yeah. and training and doing yeah. more and putting more in your game and you knew when um, you were in there, like your back was against the wall, like you had to perform. So more pressure. Yeah. I know your parents play a big role in your life, but whenever, when you're growing up, I'm always curious to see how people deal with teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same with coaches. Like how did your parents talk about coaches or talk or interact with coaches? Um, they were a little bit different. So. My dad played professional basketball, so he he's very, like, he kind of knows that if you're not playing, it's bad enough. The last thing you want to hear is, like, your parents bashing the coach or telling you you should be playing and fueling the fire. So he was kind of there just supporting. Um, my mom's a little different. She's a little more fiery, um, which I kind of ap appreciate more. Like, her fire was always out of love, so, like, if if there was a coach that over the years has given me a hard time or wasn't playing me I think in your parents eyes like you're always the Leo Messi of whatever team you're on and I think that's how my mom sees me and you know what right or wrong I think it's just because like her kids are her kids and no one's more important and yes it sometimes is frustrating when she's like in my ear like rah, rah, rah. but at the same time it's like she's just so there's not she hides nothing and she's like so authentic and it's like F this you should be playing you should be playing so you gotta <laughs> respect her authenticity how did they deal with your like that's the dealing with your adversity how did they deal with your success how did they keep you grounded we didn't what was interesting is we we're we were a huge sports family like my brothers um played for division one football i played division one soccer um so when we came home like by the time we got to that level we were all playing division one sports i think that was the first time where everyone was just like let's just like not go there like, sports was just so in our life, like, always, like, abundant, like, to always being talked about. And I think when we all would get, like, we kind of found, like, this, like, solace and sanctuary in doing and talking about everything but sports when we were together, which is nice. Was that an unwritten rule, or was that ever said, that we're not going to do this? Ah, uh, sometimes it had to be said, yeah. but I think most of the time, like, my family's fun. We have a lot of different interests. Uh, we like to go out and do things. It was more of that. My mother let me attend country club camp every single day in the summers between 4th and 7th grade and has taken me 
away for many, many hours to make up for this technical work that I missed out during my prime development <laughs> years. Did I tell you that? <laughs> no, it's written down in one of your blogs. I know that's a joke, but... No, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. <laughs> Expand. Yeah, I was just like, I mean, I'm, I think you know, as you know from working with me, I'm, I love to have fun. And so when I was, I don't know how old you're in fourth grade, I think you're 10. It was like, what's more fun? Like going to dribble in a chair or like going to put on your white polo with your friends and play tennis and have filet mignon for lunch. So like it was definitely <laughs> option B. And it was just, it was the thing, it wasn't as, it wasn't the country club camp that was so bad. It was like the amount of time that I went. I remember in the summer just going for like three weeks at a time and not touching a soccer ball, which was fine in like fourth grade, but like seventh grade, probably not the best thing. I don't know. I swear that's like still why I can't strike a good ball with my laces with my right foot because of country club camp. But. Country club camp. But then how does that, like, yeah, it might, in, it might impact you technically to an extent, but that's got to impact you a lot psychologically in terms of hunger and motivation because people think that's a lot of reason why we don't produce X type of players in the US is because life is too comfortable. Yeah. So if life could have been comfortable for you, what gave you the motivation to dig deep and do more than others? I think it was when I, like, I think, like, eighth, ninth grade is when you start to come into your own and, like, establish your core values. So for me, I think, um, you know, I, like, the fact of the matter was I was never going to be one of those kids that was being pushed because, like, soccer was my way out. I think, like, I could have been doing a million things um, with the educational opportunities I had and, like, the, my family's background and stuff, but... Um, I think your core values come from your, your parents and your family. And what my family instilled in me was that, um, like, com- like, there's no monetary value on ambition and success and hunger and working towards your dreams and kind of proving doubters wrong. And so for me, um, that's kind of what where it came from was just, like, this inner... I think every player that gets here, they have this bur- they have this desire that kind of like being we're afraid of being average and like having a regular life and just a comfortable normal thing like isn't good enough and it's never something we're gonna be okay with and that's what it came down to for me. On that, there so much talk today about college, how it hinders development, and how it's tough, especially on the men's side, why we shouldn't be going to, we should be doing this, should be doing that there. What did college, you mentioned the adversity side of what it gave you. What did it give you as a soccer player? I don't know. The college one's tough because in all honesty, like, I I played against some great players. I played with some great players. I played under a great coaching staff. Um, but I think the biggest difference with college is just that you're very distracted. You know, the reality is, like, most, like... If you went out twice in one week, it's a good week in college. You're like, wow, I took care of my body this week. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm a health nut. I remember, like, there, were, there was a period in one junior, like, sophomore spring, I decided not to go out for, like, two weeks. And my friends were like, what are you a health freak? So, so I think, like, you just have so much going on. You have your, like, you have your, you may, be ch- may or may not be chasing a significant other. Like, you have your friends. You're trying, like, there's just so much around, um... That I wouldn't say like it's it's the college soccer environment that may not necessarily be good as that might be so far behind professional. I think it's more just if college if like I had a synonym for college it would be distracted, and like that's just like I don't think it's a secret that without saying too much that you do things in college that aren't um, impeccable for your body and your athletic development. Yeah. So. I mean, would I go a hundred times over? I'd go to college again. I got a great education. I played under a great coach. I made some friends for life. Um, so I think that's something that if I were maybe a men's player deciding like what I wanted to do for my development, I would I would probably choose to go pro. But um, the reality is in the women's game right now, we're not making enough money to pass up a college degree. And in my opinion, the four funnest years of your life. Well, sitting in Portland, Tobin Heath, Lindsay Horan opted to go to Europe for their development. How would an 18-year-old Stephanie McCaffrey have done in a French academy system? She wouldn't have done it. She wouldn't have went? I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone. And I think that, um, you know, there's... Whether, whether like, I think for me, different, peop- different people have different views on this. Um, like, I just, I value in life 
the root of happiness for me is relationships and um, I think happiness is kind of unconditional and that it shouldn't depend on external factors like soccer like like success like awards like all of these things so um, that's just kind of like my, the way I like look at my life in general so my kind of view is work as hard as you can to achieve your, achieve your dreams like but put your relationships first and for me I think it just like would that that's the one thing that I couldn't have done at 18 was like move away in, in from my family I was just too young and I don't think there's any harm or harm in admitting that I think I don't think I could have handled being away from my family I think whatever however good the soccer situation was it wouldn't have panned out for me because I would have been so scared and unhappy do you look at those players, or even the Sam Kerrs and the Yukis here, as possessing something different mentally, or anything but technically in their game? That maybe you're like, oh, if I had to grow up in a different environment, I would yes. have developed some what you do. I think for sure. I think, um, you know, it's tough because, like, I there's no doubt in my mind. Like, if if you went straight to professional at 18, like, I would be a better player, but. Um, it's just again like is be, like being somewhat being being better tactically wasn't worth it to me to move away from my family and i think i'm fine admitting that and i think that's the same thing um i would i think like i would definitely be better i don't think it would have transformed my entire life maybe i'm wrong i don't know i mean i don't i think looking back a lot of times like retrospectively and being like what if what if can leave you unhappy but um for me yeah, like I would have been, I would have been a better player, but not good enough to move away from home and give up a college degree. Most importantly, they say that every level requires a better version of yourself as you're moving up. What was it about the national team level and the training? Like, what were the, where were you tested the most there? Uh, I think it was. I think it's mindset, and I think it's technical ability. Um, I think that every girl there is just. They have this like they're just warriors and they're so focused and they're the most like the air in there is thin almost because you're so hyper competitive like girls will just they'd like rather they they'd die on the field before they give their spot and I think that every girl in the NWSL is definitely hungry for success but there's just something different about the national team level there's like a fire in their eyes and the way they compete um, that kind of sets the standard for women's soccer not just in the US but worldwide I think it's a huge reason on why they've been so successful is because they thrive under pressure um, they thrive in competition and they th thrive when their backs are against the wall and um, you see that very quickly when you get in there how much of that culture is like you've got how many hundreds of college programs that mm -hmm. are trying to shape culture yeah. with we are going to be about this this is our mantra this is our poster this is our hashtag whatever it is how much of that is in the US women's soccer much of it's natural or how much of it is like do you have to be reminded of someone every day saying this is what it's going to be like or this is remember this is who we are or is it just basically um incidental see i think the biggest difference like you said about girls who get girl a lot of every girl that's a regular with the national team like that's ingrained into them mm. like this is that it's in their dna like that this is who we are this is our standard like if you miss a pass it's not funny if you mess up like you're you're held accountable like their standards of personal accountability are just like at the kind of like peak of women's sports um and I think that like it, that starts at the national team and there's definitely a little bit there's definitely like a ton of that in the end of Bissell and then a little bit less in college but I think like the national team is the first time where every single player there like they don't need any kind of a boost you know from an outside coaching world and I think that one of the reasons why, personally, like North Carolina did so well this year is that they're the closest to that national team level in terms of their standards and their mentality and their fight. Did you change when you went to that environment? Because you obviously had to adapt. Did you take away any long-lasting changes in your life? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing for me was that you have to be okay with you have to just kind of read it when everyone around you is that good you have to redefine your um definition of success because like i think i walked away from that environment like i put i gave it everything i could but the reality was like 
the players playing in wide forward positions, like at that time, I think it was Tobin, Megan Rapino, Mal, they were just a little bit better. And you have to learn to take pride in having like super, like in core values instead of like results, which is like accountability, like doing your best, like leaving no stone unturned in terms of preparation and stuff like that. Like being in all, in all while like trying to achieve those personal girls, like balancing that out with being a good teammate. And that's kind of the lesson I took from that. We always have this discussion. The best players are bring a level of selflessness. Good players are good people. Yeah, I think um, for whatever reason, um, like especially now, I've I've seen that with the Red Stars, like this, like you could argue that um, Sam and Julie are probably our two best players. And I think that one of the reasons we've been so successful this year is that when your two best players are also like incredibly selfless, the culture just bleeds down and permeates through the group. Um, and I think that for us, like, that's why the, the, like, I had heard a lot of stuff about Sam and that's like the best thing that she's brought to this environment is, um, playing at such a, the, the highest level you can play at in the world for a forward, but doing it in a way that's really selfless and humble. And you can just see like when other, when Alyssa Mott scores, she's just not at, she's more excited than when she scores herself and things like that. And while Sam's doing that from the front, like Julie and Alyssa are leading us from the back, like with that selflessness and the drive of just wanting to win. As coaches, we categorize players, technical, tactical, physical, social, psych. If you were to flip that and do it for coaches and you present it to the National Coaches Association today mm -hmm. in the US, where would you say coaches should improve or spend the most time, more time developing? I think coaches should really work on um, player management. And I think, especially with women, notice how their mood kind of reverberates through the group. The coach's mood? The coach's mood, yeah. Like, um, I think a lot of times player wa players walk to the field and the, like, the first thing they do is try to, get tr like, or at least I do, is try to get a gauge of like what kind of day it's going to be. Um, I think some coaches do that better than others, but um, for me, I tend to, thrive in environments where the coaches moods aren't as mercurial like they're very if we win great but like let's get back to business if we lose that sucks but let's get back to business I think when it gets to be very up and down and stuff like that that's when it can get a little bit dangerous or not dangerous I should say that's when teams I could say coach a coach can affect a team's potential in my experience so it's consistency you yeah. would want emotional yeah. consistency emotional stability consistency. and I think that when you have emotional consistency with your coach um, the team becomes less the team has more emotional energy available at the end of the year like so for this year for example I think that our balance of coaching like the balance of the whole coaching staff um, has left the team like with a ton of emotional energy going into tonight, into the semifinal. And that's like why I really feel in my heart, like we have the best chance to win in my three years that I've been here. Is because there's like a togetherness and we were just talking about it like last year, for whatever reason, I think a million different reasons there, the team was psychologically drained at the end of the year. Like, and when we went to dinner last night, or I'm sorry, on Sunday night as a team, everyone was talking about how like, oh my God, it's the last day of the year. And like, we were so excited to spend four hours of our free time together and we were trying to kind of boil down and um distillate to get to the reason and the reason was that when there's no when there's less drama there's like more available for the good things and the good times and I think anything a coach can do with emotional consistency to contribute to that is huge for the team's success we'll come back to that with, with your injury and health problems this season you've obviously had more time to observe and see the team dynamics and you're very very speaking to you you're very very aware of it but speaking not from a red stars player speaking again on the collective college club high school club teams where do you think coaches make the biggest mistakes on building teams team spirit team chemistry all these buzzwords culture things we throw about where do we get it wrong I think that coaches need to look at the big personalities in a team. I think there's two ways to gain kind of respect and clout in a locker room and that's by being very good on the field and being a very strong and like powerful leader and personality off the field. And I think that um obviously like 
it just kind of it's it's like human nature and social nature that when the good players talk people listen um i think it's like also in social nature that when bigger personalities talk people listen as well and i think that making sure that the pillars of your team like the pillars of the locker room um are all kind of wired in the same manner like so like what like um for example for the red stars i i know you said take yourself out of but uh there are certain teams that are kind of professional in the sense they want to get in, do their business, and get out. And there are certain teams where, like, the team is more of a family environment. Um, I think that – but I really believe that both team environments can thrive. I really do. But I think that the culture and the cohesiveness works better when the majority of the big personalities on that in that spectrum, like, all kind of are on in the same side of the line. And for the Red Stars, for us, I think we're a younger group, which is part of it. Um, we're all a very social group, so like this is kind of more of a family. Let's spend time together, like a little bit of a rah rah group. Um, older teams, maybe some men's teams. I'm not really sure. Like I've seen like documentaries, like the Man City documentary and stuff like that, where they seem like they come in, they do their business, they care a lot about each other, and then they go home. And there's like a ton of respect to be found in that too. But um, I would say, really taking a look if you're bringing a big personality in, how are they going to affect the locker room? Because I think when you get to the semifinals and you're splitting hairs, which way that hair splits has a lot to do with off the field. A lot more to do with off the field at that point than it does on the field, because on the field it's so close. Marginal gains. Yeah. Yeah. But with with that family, so like going, going to that there, people say, like one of my complaints or what thing that annoys me with coaching community is saying like oh we want to make it a family environment but there's not like there's a hundred different ways families your family's different from my family yeah so where how do you get the balance from you said it's a social group and the socials but does the team have to spend time together can you so can you manufacture that for example so say you're not blessed to have a personality like julie or a personality like sam and you have to manufacture that yourself mm-hmm. as, a, as a college coach in a short period of time do you think that you can get in trouble by making, or, or should you be then saying, right, mandatory, we're going to spend two hours together, we're going to go to the movies together, we're going to have dinners together? Is it through time, or is it, how is that No, done? I think it's through personalities. Like, you have to do your best to recruit or to draft or to trade, whatever you have to do, whatever level it's at, to trade for a group that's going to get along. I think if you have a group that doesn't get along and isn't naturally like personality wise meant to spend time together then forcing them to spend two hours at the movies can even backfire it's gonna be be a problem yeah Yeah. so i think like it it's it's all for me the majority of it's in the pre-process especially in the professional level because like people are who they are i mean at 25 like yeah you can change but you're pretty developed as like the person and the values you have so um it all comes for me and like the pre-work of who you have there and you got to do your research and research should be just as much about watching game tape as it is of talking to people as how is this person, what is she like, what is she not like. Because um, I think some of the best teams, even in the history of this league, have been like made and lost with those kinds of decisions. Like in North Carolina, for example, um, when I have a couple good friends on the team, and like one of, for me, like something that's really stuck out is when you watch them shooting, when the players that don't play shoot after games, the first four people shagging balls are... Lynn, Abby, Sam, the national team players sit and shag balls for them. And um, that's, I asked Sam actually, I was like, does your coach make you do that? And she was like, oh no, like we just like did that on our own. And I think that um, for, like, that's just an example of how uh, Paul's done a really good job of kind of gathering a group of personalities that all fit together. You know? Like, that's like that was a really cool thing. And for me, like, that small moment is a really in- big indication of why they're so successful. So, when your FIFA ratings for your games or your championship manager ratings for a game and they're talking about technical skill and speed and all that, mm-hmm. there, you think it's important to have like what you are as a person should actually be the biggest foundation yeah. of that. So, you wouldn't, you wouldn't draft if you had the female Messi or you were a GM of a men's team. And he's not a very good person. You would think twice about bringing that person in. I would. I think I, what I would do is like I would definitely like if they're that good, they're that good. Um, I would. I would do more research if it was a situation where research had to be done, and I would also look at the personalities I already had. I would talk to my team, being like, "What's your experience with this person? How do they fit in?" and things like that. 
I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's about blackballing anyone. I would just say it's about doing more research other than hey, like is this person cool and have someone say yeah and then be like okay and hit the button. If you're at Boston College, you're in an ACC school, you're in a much better position to make you're much uh, I don't know what the word is, make that decision. Yeah. Much freedom to make yeah. that decision. If you're a mid-major or a lower major or small and you're trying to grow, then sometimes the talent must overcompensate yeah, for the personality. Amen. How would you deal with that there? I would weigh, I, w- I would like kind of use a scale, like how good is this player? How bad do we need them positionally? And like how good or bad are they going to make my team? So like if you say it's on a scale of 10, if you need the player like 8 out of 10, and you haven't heard great things, but it's not like they're a monster, I'd say go for it. Um, if the player's like an 8 out of 10 and personality-wise, the way you think they'll fit is a 2 out of 10, I would say no. Um, especially in college when teams are that young. Like I've, see, I've heard like horror stories about teams fracturing because mm-hmm. they just can't get along. So I think it's about striking the right balance. Um, I think if there's kind of one person that needs to like be pushed and like get on the train, like there's it's important to have faith in people's ability to evolve um, and to get along with others. But I think it's more like the quantity. I guess it's, I would also look at the quantity of kind of rogue personalities I had that might not fit in with the DNA of the group. Yeah, because the more diversity in the personalities yeah. can help a team. Yeah. Come on, we'll come back to that in a second. You've, you've used social media to express your personality in mm-hmm. the game. Uh, you've also written a com- column called The Babbler. <laughs> doing my research here, it's brilliant. You said you won't be he- hearing too much about what we're doing on the field here at Chicago. You will hear about our van rides, coffee runs and superlatives for things like coolest travel outfit, social LVC, least valuable contributor for away trips. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that your image has ever created a negative stereotype for you professionally? For sure. I think that there are... I've actually thought a lot about this. I think that there's people who, you know, like they want... They they want to keep who they are, like, very um, kind of behind the curtain and just up front put this, like, professional up front, um, like, figurehead of themselves where, like, there's certain... That, that's totally fine. I think... You have to, like, when you realize that there are going to be thousands of people looking at your social media, you have to really sit and think about, like, what do I want out of this? And um, for me, like, it was so – it felt so inauthentic to who I am. It feels so authentic to who I am as a person to not have humor in my social media. And um, I would hope that people who have been around me and seen me in a training environment and been on a team with me – would say like she's a good teammate she works hard and when she's at training she's at training and eventually you come to real eventually I came to realize that that's all I care about if the if my coaches and teammates like having me around in in the soccer environment I'm going to be myself on social media and with like barring hurting anyone's feelings like that's like how I decided to move forward like from a professional standpoint and if people have a problem with that they have a problem with that but I mean this is five years of my life and I can't hide my personality on social media which is a huge part of our career and how we make money and stuff like that do you think it's difficult then for young players to express and promote a level of authenticity in the game when we're judged constantly about what we post and then in many cases then you have teams then look and feel the same so you almost then completely yeah. nullify any diversity or energy yeah I think what I try to do with that, uh, this is a tough one, is that when I post now, I really kind of think of what is this, like, go through, like, every single person I can think of and think, like, could this be distasteful and hurtful in any way? And if I, my rule is, like, if I sit and think about it for, like, 15 minutes, which I do now, um... And it just really seems in good fun that I post it. And even now, like, I'll post a picture of my mom, like, going to the country club. And someone will say, you shouldn't be promoting, like, elitism. Someone commented that. And there's always going to be one person out of... If 75,000 people are seeing your Instagrams, 
and one person doesn't like it, fine. Um, but I like to think that my Instagram is in good fun and it's about kind of sharing my life and who I am as a person with the fans who support us and it seems like a lot of people like it. So um, for me, like, it's worth... I wouldn't say... That, I don't even feel like there's risk in that. I mean, the people who I would feel like disapprove of my Instagram post as a professional player now. Um, they were, they wouldn't like me if they met me in person. So You're not it, that bothered. Yeah, I'm not that bothered. That negativity, say like as a professional player, you've got to deal with a lot of negativity. Yeah. In the U- Europe, UK, that negativity is if you lose, you're going to get dogs abuse in the media. Well, over here, it seems to be that negativity is just, it's just the general undercurrent of mm-hmm. negativity in society do you think it's tough that whenever you're you're being judged not by a result you're being judged by a post or by something that you're trying to do does it does that play in your mind or how much does that impact negatively impact your life um it, it used to a lot more than it does now i think it, it it used to a lot right when i came out of college that kind of marginally decreased as I grew, as I went through like my professional ranks and I went through ups and downs a lot harder than someone not liking what I post or who I am. And then I think especially now with being so sick for this long, it's just like you got to really prioritize like what, who you are, what you value, what you put emotional energy into. And um, again, as long as you're not hurting everyone and, and for me, like you're giving an, everyone an equal opportunity to be who they are and express themselves, you're free to do the same. Starting Hidden Gems, a non-profit specializing in connecting girls playing soccer in un- un- underserved communities with NWSL. What was the inspiration behind it? Um, I think the inspiration was kind of going back to our first question when you were like, did you face any adversity kind of growing up through high school? And I was like, no, literally no, because I, was granted like every favorable thing you could think of I was given I was put on a club team that cost $30,000 a year my mom was the coordinator for that club team in addition to that um I was training with Christine Lilly like I was driving to the practices in an Escalade like it was ridiculous I in like on top so like I think what really struck me was that on top of having all of the stuff that I had thrown in my face to make my journey as easy as possible my parents were then the family that could afford to go and pay the professional players to coach me and there was just like as I grew up and I saw like you you're just exposed to more with age and I would do clinics for communities where girls are coming up and they don't really have much it just like started it was like this growing feeling that felt like it just didn't sit well with me and I kind of started thinking well these kids, they're not going to get to play for the club teams that cost $30,000 a year. They're not going to have access to the best schools. What can like I do in the smallest way to level the playing field? And I just kind of got this idea that if you can give them exposure to, prof- to professionals and kind of connect the top of women's soccer with what would some would say is the bottom, um, you could really boost these girls' confidence and like inspire change within them. So that's where kind of where it came from. And then I just figured out that if you fundraise and move the money from wealthy suburban parents paying coaches to coach their daughters to a charity paying professional coaches, you can choose their clientele. And that clientele, my first choice, is always going to be girls who otherwise couldn't afford it themselves. Mm. You obviously think soccer is too exclusive in yeah. the U.S. I do. I just I, th- I think especially for women, um, it's getting better, but we're still miles away from where we need to be. Um, I don't think... Um, I don't think things like the Development Academy or ECNL are going to make it any easier. I mean, I was fortunate enough to participate in those, but my mom I'll joke with my mom and say, like, oh, I got a full scholarship, and she say, yeah, well, I paid for club soccer. And when you do the years out, it actually turns out not to be that different. And so over time, when you have a club soccer career that can cost over $100,000, like, scholarships only go so far for so many kids. You're never going to be able to pay for the club, pay for club soccer for – or I should say this, like you can, the, a lot of times charity and um, philanthropy is finite in dollar amount and you're never going to be able to touch all the girls that deserve a chance. But 
at the same time, just because you see that wall in front of you, you can't give up and say, well, it's out of my control. You have to do whatever you can to kind of chip away at that wall. And Hidden Gems is kind of my hammer for that. What's been the response from fellow players with it? It's been What's been awesome is that um, well, professional players, uh, like in the NWSL, they coach for extra money because like, we don't make a ton of money. It's no secret. Um, what's been awesome, though, is that when if you present them with the salary they deserve, which is like $100, an hour, 100 to $150 an hour, they are so much more excited to put that money towards girls that would otherwise never have it. I think... Pretty much everyone feels like that. You know, if you're getting paid the same amount, why wouldn't you help the underdog? Why wouldn't you help the kid that otherwise would never be able to do it? And why wouldn't you help the kid that doesn't even know what club soccer is? You know? That's a pretty cool concept. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the plan is to go and put one in every city, every, every NWSL Yeah, city. so the goal, um, the goal initially was to just kind of start in Chicago um, and, go, and see how that worked. Uh, but the pilot program went so well that... We, my goal for next season, um, knock on wood, health pending if I'm back, is to have an, a hidden gems team in every city. So it would be Chicago, Utah, Portland, and that's what I've been doing when I've been traveling with the team in addition to supporting you guys in different cities is kind of meeting and talking with people in those sit, uh, organizations to uh, hopefully have a hidden gems um, group and kind of coaching group and the, the majority of the NWSL teams. So I'll kind of run it from Chicago, and then um, when I'm away, I'll kind of be in touch with a leader from each team that helps out in each city and go from there. If there's a, a youth coach listening to this here and thinking, God, that's a great idea, I'd love to get involved in that there, but I'm not in a city or I'm not associated with an NWSL team, is there anything they can do? Should See, they contact yeah, you or anything? Yeah, other? I've thought about that. Um, my like first, I'm, I'm open to hearing from anyone. Um, I think for me, like, I want to make sure we don't grow too fast. And, and I'm really focused on kind of quality over quantity. And by that, I mean, like, I'd rather change 10 girls' lives in Chicago than do a clinic for 300. That's kind of a one-off because I've done that before. Um, and the response, we I haven't gotten as much like, of a positive response as I have, like, with seeing the changes in a few individuals. So my I think my answer would be, I'd be happy, I definitely want to talk to you, hear, you out, hear your idea, but my first inclination would be, let's keep it eight, like, I'm, I'm a full-time professional athlete, um, so, like, eight cities for me right now is kind of all I can handle. Yeah, good. All right, last three questions for you. What advice would you have for the young superstar, 12 years of age, being told that she's the most talented player and... She's getting all those awards like you were. What would you say to a 12-year-old Stephanie McCaffrey or 13-year-old? I would say, I, I feel like when five years ago, I would have said, like, be ready. Said something to them, like, be ready to face adversity. But now, like, my older self would kind of give them advice on how to face that. And that would be to have confidence in your core values um, and to really develop, start thinking about who you want to be as a person and develop this inner strength to let those core values carry what carry you through whatever life throws at you. Whether that's confidence, um, sometimes it's going to be empathy for other teammates that are going through adversity. Sometimes it's going to be um, vulnerability and being able to, like, before you kind of fight, being able to process like negative emotions that might happen. It's dealing with fear. I think fear of failure is something that we all face, you know? So that would be it for me. The parent who thinks that they have the player or wants to, like wants to produce, I want my player to play in college, I want my daughter to play in college. What can I do to help that there? I would just say the same thing. I would say as a parent, very few parents are gonna actually help their kids on the field that I think they all would like to say otherwise but the reality is it's not going to happen so it would be just be to continue to again back to the core values like build find ways like in the in 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 like their home or in school or whatever that may be harp on the importance of developing core values to get you through adversity that you'll face that will get get you through 
consequences of on the field play, whether that's failure, whether that's success, whether that's being a good teammate, things like that. I would say definitely um, dealing with the feel of failure, failure, dealing with adversity, and probably most importantly is like dealing how throw that like balancing that with being a good teammate. I think like now a lot of you'll read a lot of like self help book self self help books or articles or things that are all about like being the best you can be and being the best, you know like like overcoming the fear of failure, overcoming adversity. But very few books talk about how do I be a good te- like how do I be a good teammate like how do I help others like how do I empower the people around me and I think that as you get older you come to find that that makes you just as if not more happy than achieving things on your own so I would say like boost the boost the kid to be able to pursue their dreams but at the same time make sure that runs in parallel with being a good person because that's the most important thing advice to the coach who I want to produce college players I want to produce professional players that 14, 15, 16 years of age, what would you say to that coach? I would say find the balance of um, accountability and it's a, I would say it's balance, the balance of accountability and push with the balance of kind of helping them through. I think it's a long, the journey to kind of the 1% at the top of anything, it's long, it's tricky, it's really happy, it's really painful. So kind of pushing them when they need to be pushed and balancing that out with you know like wearing whatever hat I, th- I would say reading the player and wearing whatever hat you need to on the day and I think that will like sometimes it will be being a father or a mother figure sometimes it will be being a really hard-nosed coach and benching them and teaching them a hard lesson and um, again just the importance of reading people because everyone's so good and it's the smallest things that are going to push you to the edge and I think people who can read people empower those around them and then that's like eventually what makes champions what a way to finish it alright last one before we're done best player played with with oh jeez um I would say going back to the time of Nash probably Rapino. it was short and it was only one and a half camps but she's just like the way her combination of technical and tactical is crazy I think you see a lot of players that are super technical and you see a lot of players that are like just like tactical savants but like her combination of both is world class and I think the fact that that still sticks with me even though um, I think she tore ACL in my second camp like on the third day but literally spending when you know you know and even two weeks in I was like this girl's special best player played against what defender gave you the most problems or you could never get past I would say Becky in and out of the league um, she just she knows what you're doing before you do it and she doesn't even have the ball it pre- represents a huge problem for you brains yeah brains timing the way she holds the line for sure Steph, thank you so much. Really enjoyed this. I appreciate all your insight. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much to Steph for joining me in that podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I could talk to Steph and her views on the game and development all day. So I had plenty of those conversations throughout the year in Chicago and loved every one of them. So really, really happy to put it together in a podcast and hopefully you enjoyed that there. Uh, takeaways for me just in that chat was basically that last kind of point about her advice to young players finding that confidence and core values and building those core values and I think in the development stage we get it wrong from a period of probably 16 17 18 just before the players arrive at college we overlook the physical the game has to move in this speed and you've got to build your strength and you've got to do this and there's your fitness packets and we don't build enough in the core values what's going to sustain these players to overcome adversity is just as important as the technical skills those mental skills those psychological skills that you know maybe we can do a little bit more with parents and that maybe we can drive a little bit more of awareness 
Uh, and it's certainly whenever you talk to Steph about her rise, you can hear how valuable her upbringing was and those values that she worked through with her family were. So love that there. Also love that that balance about finding the, the balance of self-motivation, uh, hunger and drive, and then selflessness. How do you balance that out with being happy for teammates? And I think there's probably a, a lot of college coaches and high school coaches and club coaches that are nodding their head and saying, yeah, that's a, that's a problem with me and my team. Uh, we don't have people that celebrate the success of other people. Um, when you get to the highest levels, and like I said, we talk about it a lot, where the, there's just a real correlation between successful, really, really top players and their ability to relate to other people, communicate to other people, uh, be happy for other people and just be a, a bundle of energy every day. <laughs> so finding ways to do that. And even, you know, what step one for me, step one would be awareness and just sitting down with a player and maybe saying, you know, I really like the way you did that. And I really like the way you ran to that player and celebrated the goal. And, and maybe it's, or it's the other way around. Like, hey, next time she scores, I expect you to go over there and celebrate and. I just think little things like that um, and always being consistent with the message we're sending about having the ability to read your actions or your behaviour inside the team environment is so important. It's important psychologically, it's important with team spirit and everyone you know, will be quick to say it's, it's obviously important tactically as well. So I uh, really enjoyed that and would love to get your thoughts. As always, please reach out, let me know what you think, at Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. Uh, love hearing what coaches thought about it, what resonated with everyone. And again, I really appreciate you listening to it. So thanks for spreading the word of the podcast. Thanks for supporting it. Have a great week. Talk soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions and resources head on over to coach kerneen on facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com